Um, good evening. Um, welcome to the December 9th business meeting of the Charlotte City Council. We apologize for getting started a little bit late tonight. As the city grows, so do all the items on our agenda. So uh, we tried to get here as fast as possible, but we apologize for, for keeping you. Uh, we're going to start out tonight with our introductions of our council, including our new council, council members, and then we will have an invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. So with that, I'm going to start with our city clerk and introduce yourself. Stephanie Kelly, city clerk. Happy Monday. Dimple Ajmer at large. Uh, Braxton Winston at large. Renee Johnson, District 4. Good evening. James Mitchell at large. Marcus Jones, city manager. Good evening, Julie Eisel, Mayor Pro Tem. Mayor Lyles is away on city business today, and Mr. Newton is not here either. Clark Van Eggleston, District 1. Malcolm Graham, District 2. Tar Picard, District 6. Victoria Watlington, District 3. Ed Driggs, District 7. Patrick Baker, City Attorney. Thank you. Um, with that, we're going to, I'm going to um, begin our meeting as we often do, as we always do, with an invocation, which is an expression or an inspiration and then we will follow that by the Pledge of Allegiance. Our invocation is intended to solemnize our proceedings and we celebrate the religious diversity of our community, including those for whom, uh, th those who choose not to have a religious faith. You are welcome to stand for this moment if you wish, but I do ask that everybody stands for the Pledge of Allegiance. So tonight I will uh, give our invocation. God, in the midst of this holiday season, please let us remember you. Let us keep in mind that amidst the activity and the hustle and bustle, let us remember why we celebrate. Let us reflect on the fact that in a season when every heart should be happy and light, many of us are struggling with the heaviness of life, burdens that can steal the joy right out of our days. Let us pause and remember for those whose hearts are battered by sorrow and sadness and for those whose lives know only conflict and confusion and for those whose bodies are tired and tested. God, draw them close to you and let them know your presence. Help us all to simplify our activities and our traditions at this time of year so that we can refocus our hearts on what is most meaningful. And we pray for peace to reign in our hearts and for grace to reflect on your gifts and for goodwill to reach out and care for our fellow man and woman. In your name we pray. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we get started this evening, we don't have it on the agenda, but we do have a special proclamation tonight. And I'm going to ask Council Member Mitchell to uh, read our proclamation. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Whereas the Joseph Charles Jones was born in Chester, South Carolina, and earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Johnson C. Smith University and a Bachelor of Law doctorate from Howard University. Whereas on February 19, 1960, Dr. Jones served as a spokesman along with few other organizers, led 200 students from Johnson C. Smith to downtown Charlotte, where they held a sit-in at lunch counters in July of 1960. All lunch counters in Charlotte were open to blacks. Where if Joseph was a founding member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, with Ella Baker, and many others at Shaw University, serving as the chair of Direct Action Committee. Whereas on February 6, 1961, Joseph, along with Charles Sherrod, Charles Jones, Diane Nash, and Ruby Doris Smith, was sent by SNCC to join the Fellowship Nine students in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and was arrested to sentence to 30 days on the chain gang. Whereas in 1966, Mr. Jones founded a movement named the Action Coordinating Committee to end segregation in the suburbs, an attempt to end racial segregation he saw occurring in the Washington Beltway. Whereas Dr. Jones organized the Bitterville Smallwood community, bringing changes to both communities. Whereas Dr. Jones practiced state 
and federal law from his home on West Trey Street to show young African American children in the community that a black man can work every day and bring change without leaving their community. Now, therefore, I, by Alexander Lyles, Mayor of Charlotte, do hereby proclaim December 9th, 2019, as Charles of Charles Jones Day. Thank you, and I understand we have uh, Dr. Jones' wife in the yes. audience this evening. Can you come forward, receive this, and shake all the council members' hands, please? Thank you. So that takes us to the public forum portion of our meeting, uh, where speakers can come down and talk about pretty much anything they want. Um, when we have over 15 speakers signed up, we go to two minutes. So do, we do have a wait list tonight. We might get to you if you're on the wait list, but we do have at least 15 speakers signed up. So. Uh, we'll go with our first speaker, Mr. Fred Mauney, who would like to speak about corruption, fraud, and the RNC. Mr. Mauney, are you here? And while Mr. Mauney comes down, um, Jonathan Fuller will be our next speaker. If Jonathan wants to go to this side and you can, uh, Jonathan is here, you can wait down there. Ladies and gentlemen. Mayor Pro Tem, ladies and gentlemen of the City Council, my name is Fred Marnie, and I'm an activist, and an uh, activist got a good bit back in the last uh, presidential, uh, the DNC convention. And what happened, there were some lawsuits filed, and there was mis misconduct, corruption and fraud, uh, contempt of court, fraud upon the court, and to get rid of the lawsuit. So afterwards, we sat there and uh, uh, did a, a time with people that nobody really cared. That nobody really cares whether there's a rule of law in this state or especially in Charlotte, North Carolina. But why the city and, and other people involved didn't do anything is there's worried about the $50 million grant that comes with bringing a, a national uh, convention. And now it's coming over about wanting to bring the, uh, uh, you know, the RNC here, which you'd be looking for the other $50 million grant. But let me kind of let you understand something. There's a whistleblower lawsuit being put together where y'all have to go back and pay $150 million back because $50 million plus triple damages to what happened at the last DNC. But I'd like to give you an idea of the criminal codes that's getting ready to hit the city and the county. And one is starts with uh, it's code three accessory after the fact, so you'll hear about that one. But then you got the Title 18, bribery, graft, and conflicts of interest. That's going to be a thing that's going to be going in front of a grand jury. Civil rights and, and, uh, and the conspiracy to violate civil rights so under Title 18. Uh, uh, conspiracy under Title 18, Chapter 19. You got contempts under Chapter 21 of Title 18. Now, Title 18, I guess I'm going to stop right now, is the criminal acts of federal, federal crimes. You got extortion and threats under uh, Title 18. You got fraud and false statements. That's what y'all filled out to get the DNC to get here at the, this time as well as last time so that you can get the $50 million uh, that comes with the uh, grant money of getting it. You got mail fraud and other fraud cases with mail and wire fraud because you had, we, it's all back and on how much emails and mails gone back and forth between y'all and the RNC as well as the federal government. You got obstruction of justice under Title 18. You got racketeering. Thank you, thank you Mr. Mone. And if, you got false engine reports. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mone. If you would like to leave your comments with the city clerk. Um, she can be sure to record well, them. We can. Well, you don't want this? If you would like to, if you didn't get to finish, you're well, welcome to leave know. your comments. So, uh, you might want to start thank arms thank you very much, Mr. Money. Our next speaker is Jonathan Fuller. Is Jonathan here this evening? Okay. Um, 
Emma Catherine Bowers. Is Emma here? From the Charlotte Mecklenburg Youth Council. Welcome, Emma Catherine. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having me. I'm Emma Catherine Bowers, co-president of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Youth Council. Charlotte Mecklenburg Youth Council is the official youth advisory council for the city of Charlotte, Mecklenburg County, and Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. It is a partnership between youth, local governments, schools, and Generation Nation. Through CMYC, Charlotte youth gain a real role and experience in policy and civic problem solving. This semester, our main issues include opportunity, equity, safety, the environment, and Charlotte's future. For example, we engaged youth in the city's 2040 plan and are currently advising CMPD. We're also getting ready for 2020 when we will help to show off our city at the RNC. Through the Youth Council, CMS students are represented on the school board by their student advisor. During the most recent 2019 election, Thousands of students across the city elected CMYC member Gabe Schull to this role. Now that your election is over, we will be reaching out to meet with you to discuss policy and ideas that are important to Charlotte youth. As always, please let us know if there is an issue you would like to refer to the Youth Council. We look forward to continuing to advise you on our concerns, ideas, and proposed solutions. In November, Youth Council co-president Essie Bonney Former Youth Council President and current Community Relations Committee member Patricia Banega Segura and I represented Charlotte Youth and led national sessions at the National League of Cities Conference in San Antonio. The conference was a great experience and we are excited to bring home new skills and ideas. Foremost, we would like to thank you all so much for your support in sending us. At the NLC and in our other work, we can see that Charlotte's Youth Council is a leader locally throughout North Carolina and at the national level. In fact, we're proud to report that Generation Nation recently won the 2019 American Civic Collaboration Award. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Emma Catherine. Our next speaker is uh, Thomas Harris. He is speaking on a ban of wild and exotic animals. Is Mr. Harris? Oh, Ms. Harris, thank you. <laughs> It's actually Tommy. I, I've had it I'm all sorry. my whole okay, life, I so it's really not a big deal, but it's Tommy with Tommy Hi, Harris. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy, so, Ms. Harris. That's okay. So change is hard and awkward sometimes, and we don't know what we don't know. And that's okay, but that's why I'm so grateful for Kristen Moyer and all the other bold animal activists or just anyone who does something about what they believe is important. Charlotte should be proud of all their tireless effort, selflessness, and courageousness to stand up and speak out for so long for change on this issue, the band of exotic and wild animal acts here in this great city. The cool thing is that we don't all have to be experts on this issue. A lot of time, research, and energy has gone into providing accurate information as to why we should ban these traveling acts and exploitation of wild and exotic animals. Here are some positive <coughs> reasons or outcomes for doing so. One, we can create jobs for the performance industry. We can inspire children to work hard and become part of the arts in unique circuses, um, families. We can improve public safety for the widely, wild, uh, sorry, widely untrained animal caregivers and audiences. Um, there would be less chance for animal and hu human disease spread. We can improve the quality of life, both, both physically and psychologically, for these animals as they travel in tight quarters without companionship that causes them much stress. And we can finally end their suffering. We can draw more folks into our city to support the arts because, as studies show, animal circuses are not as popular as human performance ones. Um, it will ultimately cost um, taxpayers less money, being that restriction is far more cheaper an option than regulations and inspections. I grew up here in Charlotte going to the circus as a kid, and in 2008, while living in East Africa, I visited an animal refuge. I learned the horrific truth as to how animals can in fact become part of the circus. They're drugged, trapped, beaten, stolen from their families um, and their homes, uh, bred, and then bred and in captivity. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Harris. Next speaker is Victoria Fowler. And Ms. Fowler, you're also speaking on uh, a circus band. And after that is Talitha Moniz McMillan, if you want to come down to the other podium. Thank you, and uh, welcome, Ms. Fowler. Hi, thank you. Is it Fowler? Fowler, thank yeah. you. Um, so I just start? Yes, go ahead. Uh -huh. So the reason I'm here today is to ban performing wild, acts, uh, wild animal circuses in Charlotte and eventually everywhere else as well. There's no denying that it's a cruel and abusive industry. Five years ago, before I made the connection with my life choices and the animals, I attended a circus, um, and there's no doubt in my mind that they were abused, tortured, and live a life that none of us would want to live. I looked up the word wild in the dictionary, and specifically coming to animals, it literally means living or growing in their natural environment, not domesticated or cultivated. So it makes no sense that, it makes no sense that we think we can train them to be what they're not meant to be. Elephants in the wild can live up to 70 years. In captivity, they live less than 40. They have a family just like most of us and like to travel in large groups with their loved ones, but in the circus, they're confined and alone. Apart from the other awful industries and hobbies like ivory and hunting, circuses have a huge impact on the numbers of these animals left. Like us, um, animals have their own lives and emotions of happiness, sadness, anger, and they should be able to freely express and live their life the way they're supposed to. Elephants, along with many others, are in danger, and we're the only ones that can help. I also found out that there are more tigers held in captivity right now than they are in the wild, which is not okay. I care very deeply and can't help but empathize with both humans and animals. I can't help but feel the pain in my heart um, just thinking about what they go through. So I ask that you all do your best and imagine yourselves or your animals if you have any. Um, I'm sure you care about them a lot and would never want them to go through what these animals are going through. Unfortunately, dogs and cats are almost always openly loved and protected by most people, but behind closed doors, there's so many other animals being tortured and abused every day, and people turn a blind eye. So I'm just, all animals deserve the same love. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Fowler. Our next speaker is also speaking on a circus band, Ms. Talitha Moniz McMillan. And follow, Ms. Mc, uh, McMillan will be Vivian Butler. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Talitha Moniz McMillian, and I'm here to ask that the ban on wild animals and circuses be implemented. As a Latinx who grew up in low-income communities, I was glad to hear members of the council voicing concerns of the underprivileged when we had this conversation two meetings ago. I was disappointed by the comments of some activists that day, but nevertheless, my advocacy today has everything to do with the animals being exploited and nothing to do with the few I respectfully disagree with. I work with a variety of matters in the community, including migrant assistance and environmental inequality. People of color have always been the backbone of movements, but between being busy struggling to survive and a number of other systemic forms of erasure, we're hardly ever the face of them. But this also highlights a disconnect between Charlotte's government and its citizens. I'm willing to bet many people don't even know this form is available to us. I didn't until last month, which says more about Kristen Moyer's amazing organizing abilities than it does about anyone's lack of care for other issues. So access to this information is also key in making sure marginalized voices have the chance to be heard here. But this issue at its core is simple. No living being is an object to be prodded as a toy for human entertainment. Disregarding the validity of someone's ability to feel and their right to a life of freedom is a symptom of a society built on white supremacy. Here we have well-meaning people who benefit from that system attempting to destroy one of its many flaws. This council nor I, unfortunately, have control over the inhumanity happening at our borders or the prison industrial complex. And while we work to dismantle these incredibly dire problems, all we can do is take wins as they come, and this has come up now. It's hard enough to fight violence in people whose system was built to thrive on it. Let us send a message that we don't allow it here in any form. We are morally responsible for becoming more ethical than the society we grew up in. And I would hate to think that if this were a proposal intended for financial profit, this council would be quicker to see it through. We need to do good things just before it's good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Vivian Butler, and followed by that will be Ms. Marisa Garst. Ms. Butler, uh, welcome. You are going to be speaking about a refund for a tiny house. Thank you. Good evening, council members. I realize my topic is somewhat different than what's considered norm for this arena. 
However, this is an avenue, not yet the only road I will pursue to get the word out to the people of Charlotte and hopefully all of North Carolina. I'd like to talk about a contractor named Kelvin Young, who is the owner of Keogh Park West and Keogh Park East Tiny Houses. This gentleman sold me several, this, this, excuse me, this gentleman sold several people, including myself, the dream of home ownership. My story is a bit different than others. I'm now disabled and had to wait years to receive my disability. Mr. Young was given my money with the promise that it would be returned within 30 days in regard to my tiny house. To date, the refund has never happened. Now I'm fighting with only the means of social arenas such as this. A few months ago, my name was finally pulled from the Charlotte Housing Authority after years on the waiting list. And all because of Kelvin Young, that too is now lost. I beg the people of Charlotte to please be aware. I'd like to, under I'd like to understand and ask why is it that we can steal a candy bar and go to jail. Yet Kelvin Young can rob people for years, lie to us, yet walk the streets of our town every day as if nothing happened. So far, excuse me, so far our laws do nothing. Where's the help for people like myself who can't afford to simply hire an attorney? I want to thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Butler, and I, I believe one of our staff members um, is going to talk to you after regarding steps that were taken to try to help out. Uh, our next speaker is Marissa Garst, and Marissa will be followed by Bethany McDonald. Welcome, Ms. Garst. Hi, thank you. So my name is Marissa Garst, and I'm also here in support of the ban on performing wild animals here in Charlotte. At the strategy session on November 12th, the council seemed to have a number of questions about what our proposed ban on performing wild animals actually says. We heard the mayor ask if the ban covered all animals or just exotic animals, and whether the ban would prohibit dog shows from coming to Charlotte. The city attor attorney mentioned frisbee dogs. Julie Eisel asked if Lazy Five Ranch would have to shut down, and if the ban would cover permanent animal displays. The city attorney mentioned concerns about the breadth of the ban as well. The mayor stated that they needed information about what constitutes a performing or exotic animal. To answer these questions, I'll summarize the proposed draft ordinance that we provided to the council and city attorney, which is of course only a draft at this point. The draft provided has one and only one narrow prohibition, that no person shall cause or allow for the particip participation of an exotic or wild animal in a traveling animal act, ride, performance, or exhibition on any public or private property in the city. It does not apply to domestic species, such as frisbee dogs. Exemptions include companion animals, pets, livestock, wildlife rehabilitators, and permitted zoos, sanctuaries, and aquariums. The draft specifically defines exotic or wild animals based on current state and federal law. The language proposed in this draft is very similar to ordinances already passed into law in over 99 U.S. localities and 46 diverse nations. We are available and happy to answer any questions or concerns you may have, and our answers will include supporting data. We assure you that every question raised at the meeting is something that has been asked and answered already elsewhere. And again, note similar actions have successfully protected both animals and citizens in communities just like ours throughout the U.S. Ringling Brothers Circus closed its doors in 2017 after 146 years of exploiting animals. This was largely due to a drop in attendance as the public has become aware of the abuse suffered by animals in the circus industry. It will not be long before all circuses will be animal free or be forced to close their doors due to drop in revenue. The city of Charlotte has the opportunity to be on the right side of history here by banning the cruel use of wild animals in the circus. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garst. Uh, Bethany McDonald. You're here this evening. And following Bethany is Abigail Adams. Welcome, Ms. McDonald. My name is actually Bethany McDonald, and I am the programs director at Heartspeed as One Foundation. I'm also a longtime volunteer with the Humane Society for about four to five years. My focus was always being a part of the iBuild program, which was building fences for dogs who spent the majority of their existence inhumanely tethered and outside. 
I've seen dogs with a four foot leash tied to a trailer full of glass. I've seen dogs tied to a tree and lying in their own feces. I've also seen dogs tied to fence posts with festering wounds and mange due to prolonged outside exposure and neglect. And none of this is illegal. None of this is policed. None of this is recognized or documented. Albeit from the amazing groups that do community outreach and make every effort possible to create a merciful existence for the animals that aren't protected due to the lack of this specific ordinance. I voluntarily participated in dozens of free fence builds to get these dogs off of their chains and into a safe, protected environment. I participated in tarp day, providing tarps for each enclosure to ensure shade and temperature control in the summer. We've also done straw day, providing straw as a conduit for warmth through the winter seasons. And I've seen firsthand the quality of a life created by these simple efforts. This isn't a matter of opinion or available resources or lack of support. This is a matter of finding a humane solution to a problem that has been completely ignored. And so I beg of you, please consider supporting our proposition to provide a quality of life that has until now not been addressed. There are several surrounding counties in North Carolina that have accepted this ordinance and for a good reason. We're committed to doing all that we can to end this abuse of treatment and we hope you'll agree to stand behind us. We have a petition signed by more than 17,000 people in support of this ordinance and we hope that you will join us. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. Ms. Abigail Adams and followed by that, if Mr. Uh, Dwayne Kite would like to come on down to this podium. Welcome, Ms. Adams. Good evening. I feel that I should be wearing a shirt tonight that said, man's best friend. Mm -hmm. Seems to be getting all the attention. I feel very sad that I'm here talking about something that is important to me. <clears throat> and that is the fact that there are so many thousands of people who are being told there's no, no low income housing in Charlotte. When I started my campaign to raise the awareness for 1,000 Keys, many hundreds of real estate agents contacted me. What they said to me is we have hundreds of houses. One man said he even had 500 houses. Then of course we all know about the catalyst. He says he has 700 houses. This is childish Klein. So we have a lot of houses here. My campaign about the 1,000 Keys is targeted to our rich sports, industry and our athletes that live in our city. We know that Charlotte has a lot of millionaires. North Carolina has a total of 201 millionaires. We have a lot of billionaires and most of them work low income people. They usually don't care that their works have slept outdoors. They don't care that our children have bathed on the way to school at McDonald's or a restaurant. But I'm here to tell you that I will campaign for 1000 keys. This is what I call the first annual Christmas wish. I write about this on Facebook and people all over the world know that right now low income housing is a target. It's a topic in every city of every state. But I'm not here tonight to say anything about this can happen. But I do know the money is in this city and the people are here. I have not named anyone to help me. I want to say the people of the world. We are all colors. We are all races. Many of you, of course, I do know that we should have a city that has the dog as the mayor and have the dog to serve us, because he does seem to be our best friend. But tonight I talk about Jesus and his two fish and five loaves of bread. I am a poor woman that lives in low income housing, and I pay $440 a month for one room. I am not ashamed of this because you have some of the richest people in our city who have been poor. Thank I will you. campaign for humans. Thank you, Thank Ms. You. Adams, very much. Mr. Uh, Dwayne Kreit, uh, followed by Beth Hahn. Mr. Kreit, welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. My name is Dwayne Kreit. I'm president of Crytek Engineering Group, headquartered in Greensboro, North Carolina. I'm accompanied by Richard Hansman, who runs our local office at 543 Cox Road in Gastonia. Uh, we are civil and environmental engineers uh, and professionals concentrating in the water resources industry. Uh, I wanted to introduce my company to you and let you know that uh, we've been in the Charlotte marketplace for over two and a half years uh, marketing this area. And although we've been successful in being a part of four projects, billable projects to date, 
that's certainly the revenue we've generated certainly is dwarfed by the amount of uh, financial resources we've applied to the area to be part of uh, this marketplace. And I started my company in 2014. And the reason why I started it was to get back to the community and be part of something great in, in water and sewer infrastructure. And since that date, we've designed projects from 24-inch pipelines to 12-inch pipelines, uh, water booster pump stations, sewer lift stations that can convey 20 million gallons a day of water, and, and much, much more. And we've done that throughout the state from Durham to Hendersonville. And one of the reasons I decided to open an office here locally is your desire and expressed desire to increase minority participation on engineering services. And I'll share this number with you that according to the city's 2018 Minority Women's Small Business Enterprise Annual Report, the goal for MWBE inclusion on engineering projects was 20.8%, based on your most recent disparity study. Uh, but however, your spend in 2018 was only 2.8% for engineering services for minority owned businesses. So I'm here and I want to take my two minutes to debunk the, the myth that there are no MBEs ready, willing, and able to perform engineering services on projects. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Kreit. Our next speaker is Beth Hahn, and followed by Beth well, is uh, Stephen Weller. If you'd like to come down, Mr. Weller, to that podium. Ms. Hahn, please. Hi, my name is Beth Hahn, and I don't consider myself a radical animal advocate, but rather an average resident of Charlotte that wants for animals what I want for this entire country, respect, kindness, and altruism for every living being. I do consider myself an advocate for humanity, though, and that includes fighting that every single person of every race and gender could achieve true equality in America. But tonight, I'm here speaking on behalf of another living, breathing life in our city that is no less deserving of kindness and humane treatment, as I would hope we could all agree that every living being, even an animal, has at least some value. While it is easy to think it's just a small issue brought on by a few animal rights advocates, there are collectively 15 other North Carolina cities and counties and 23 states with anti-tethering laws, which proves this is not just a concern for a few radical Charlotte residents, but a major and validated concern statewide and nationwide. Charlotte is far behind on something other cities have already addressed years ago, something deemed to be inhumane by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Animal Welfare Act. Yet, we continue allowing it to happen day after day to the animals in this city. Dogs have literally frozen to death on chains in Charlotte because we don't even have a minimum temperature law in effect at the absolute least. These expert sources alone should be more validation than any heat map can provide to you. Vast research has already been done by experts around the country and the results are untenable. The results show that tethering is absolutely outdated and inhumane. If this ban is put into place, there are countless resources for everyone, low-income families included. Holly's Hope is just one nonprofit that I have personally worked with that will build a fence for any family with a dog in need, completely free of charge to the owner. The options and resources are unlimited. We aren't asking for something unprecedented. We are asking that you would join all the other forward-thinking North Carolina cities in setting a new standard for the way we treat the animals of Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hahn. Next speaker is Stephen Weiler. Mr. Weiler here. Okay, then we go to um, Ms. Delise Reichardt. Good evening. To begin, I'd like to thank each of you all for your work and for allowing me to speak this evening. I'm here today in support of the adoption of an anti-tethering law here in Charlotte. As mentioned, there are over 17 cities and counties that have already adopted an, a complete ban on unattended tethering in the, in the state of North Carolina, including areas like Chapel Hill and Durham County. Countless others have strict restrictions of three hours or less, such as Raleigh and Orange County. Animals cannot speak for themselves, so we must do it for them. 
And it is very possible to care for all of God's creatures, human and animal alike. It's very possible, and it's actually our duty. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because tethering has no socioeconomic boundaries, we like to say that we are here to help educate the public. We want to come together as a community to assist families in need and in bettering the lives of their pets and bettering their lives. Most people welcome the help. They would love to see their animals running free inside a fenced area. It has been referenced in previous meetings that tethering a dog has been done for generations and somehow that makes it okay. I would like to remind the council that why it is true that tethering has been done for generations, it doesn't make the act right or just. To remind you that some of the most horrific atrocities in our nation's and our world's history were carried on and accepted for generations. It certainly did not make those acts right just are acceptable by any moral compass. <clears throat> As one of our city council members referenced, Gandhi once stated, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way in which its animals are treated. Let this statement guide Charlotte into the future and to, into the year of 2020. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Reichert. Uh, is Jasmine Pitcher here to speak on gun violence in Charlotte? And followed by Ms. Pitcher will be our last speaker, Mr. Juan Yuvin. Thank you, Ms. Pitcher. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jasmine Pitcher, and I'm a student at UNC Charlotte. I have had the privilege of living for 19 years before being directly affected by gun violence in my community. For hundreds of thousands of Americans, that is a pipe dream. Every single American has the right to grow up, to get an education, and to raise their children without a statistically supported fear of personally dealing with the aftermath of gun violence in their community. You have the power to advocate for and with us as we demand that reasonable legislation be put in place to address this issue. There is a sign at every entrance to my school that says, guns prohibited on this campus except where allowed by law. Every time I drive past that sign, I feel insulted. We as a public university look to state and federal legislature to help create an environment where hopefully a generation of future students will not walk to classes and be sick to their stomachs with the memories of their experiences. According to the CDC, over 36,000 Americans die as a result of gun violence every year with an additional 100,000 wounded. Lest we be misconstrued as advocating only for those in this country who have yet to experience a mass shooting, let me make it clear that that is not the case. Over 22,000 are suicides, close to 13,000 are homicides, and the list goes on. According to the American Journal of Medicine, Americans are 25 times more likely to die from gun violence than residents of peer nations. This is unacceptable, and we cannot allow our silence to declare it so. Thank you very much, Ms. Pitcher. Our last speaker for the evening is Juan Yuvin. Uh, is Mr. Yuvin here? Thank you. Uh, hey, good evening. My name is Juan Yevin. I'm, I'm here to talk about the, ML, uh, about the MLS deal. On December, 20, on December 2nd, WFE reported that James Mitchell said that the majority of council supported giving David Tipper and, as much as $110 million of public money to, to help the, land the team. I have exchanged emails with some of you and I have spoken to a couple of you on the matter. I'm here to confirm that I'm here to get confirmation from you that zero dollars of public money are going to go towards the, towards the purchase of the team. David Tepper has a net worth of $12 billion. What is the logic behind giving a billionaire our money? There's city tents on the outskirts of town. There's another city tent on the corner of University City and North Tryon. Charlotte DOT does not have the funds to install speed bumps. Residents are required to fund their own speed bumps. Uh, weights and water management tells me that they do not have, they do not have the funds to address class Anything below, anything below our Class B flooding issue. The city has ballooned overnight, excuse me, the city has ballooned nearly overnight. 
and I'm not seeing the elements necessary to support population growth, i.e. roads, sewers, school, grocery stores, and other basic necessities. So again, I pose the question, what is the logic behind giving billionaires my money and other residents' monies? So, and uh, are you guys placing procedures in place to ensure that MLS team will remain in Charlotte for a period of at least 10 years? Are you guys getting any guarantees that employees supporting the MLS team, i.e. janitor security, security guards and other, and other members will, getting, will be getting full-time jobs that have benefits and that these jobs will not be outsourced to HMS hosts? Last, to, miss, to add, uh, you are a Republican. Your party is all about free markets. According to the Business Journal, you view the possibility of committing taxpayer money to, ML, to the MLS team, which I'm quite possible by that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And with that, we conclude the public forum portion of our meeting. Uh, thank you all for coming and for those who are willing to come down and, and take some time to speak. Uh, the next up on the agenda is our consent agenda items. Um, I would like uh, thank you. a motion to adopt items 16 through 54 in one motion for, uh, with the exception of items number 20 and 43, so which we will be pulling for a separate vote. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, with that, um, all in favor of accepting those consent agenda items? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Um, <laughs> Spent a whole lot of money. <laughs> okay, so with that, we're going to go to item number 20. Excuse me just a second. Who's that? 20. Yeah, she was. Find item number 20. Did you pull that? To item number 19, so bear with me a second. Okay, item number 20 is on street parking program management services. I need a motion to approve a contract with Republic Parking System for on street parking program management services for a term of two years and authorize the city manager to amend the contract consistent with the purpose for which the contract was approved. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, any discussion on this item? Mr. Winston. Uh, Mr. Manager, I, I would just, I'll be voting against this, and I'm, I'm sure this is not a surprise. I've asked um, for us to look at our parking and towing ordinances and, and the way we approach this. Um, we haven't done this, so I will not be voting to kind of maintain the status quo. I understand this is a, uh, um, a limited extension. Uh, I hope uh, that we get through this two-year period, uh, we can address this. So, but I'll be voting now. Okay. All in favor of item number 20? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Okay. That item passes with one opposed. Thank you. The next item is item number 43, which is the airport janitorial services. And we do have speakers signed up for that, which um, we did that before. Okay, before I take a motion. So we have nine speakers speak, signed up to speak on the airport janitorial services. Um, we'd like to welcome first Mr. Sean Bromfield. And followed by Mr. Bromfield, we would like to have uh, Lauren uh, Conan come down. You can come down to the other. Uh, podium. Welcome, Mr. Bromfield, and you have three minutes to speak. Thank, Thank you. you, Mayor Pro Tem and uh, City Council. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening. Uh, definitely uh, want to express our uh, sincere appreciation for this opportunity. I can tell you that not only are we uh, extreme, extremely humble, uh, but we are honoured to be considered for this opportunity here with the uh, City of Charlotte and with the Charlotte Airport. Um, as you probably are well aware, I stand here before you today representing 140,000 employees on behalf of ABM. I'm actually here with our entire aviation team, leadership team, and our five uh, business inclusion, inclusion partners that we've included in this contract in our proposal. Uh, we have committed to the city and to the airport a 30% business inclusion partnership. 
which means that they will be involved in uh, managing and overseeing, uh, along with our support, the 30 per cent of this contract. Uh, we believe and know that uh, through our experience of working in airports, and we have a tremendous number, a trem tremendous amount of experience in working airports and in aviation, our company is actually founded on janitorial services, uh, and we're now a 110-year-old company, publicly traded. Uh, we recognize the immense decision that's being made here, and we absolutely do not take that lightly. We recognize that this is a big decision for the airport as well as for the city council members. Uh, what we do pride ourselves in doing is developing and creating career opportunities for our employees. It's not just about a job for us. We develop and, uh, and streamline uh, a career path for employees that allows them to advance and to develop. We do the same thing for our business inclusion partners. It is our desire through all of our training programs, through our education, uh, we've committed on this contract a number of items, and I'll list just a, f a few of them. Uh, we perform annual employee surveys where we're able to actually pulse check with employees anonymously. Uh, we, are, we have uh, retention plans as well. We, we do a 1% KPI bonus plan that we've incorporate, incorporated here as well. Uh, we, we have uh, a number of other benefits that we offer our employees, all of which will be transferred to these employees. We have a discounted stock purchase program. Uh, and we also do a lot of rewards and recognition around 110% club, uh, recognizing individuals for exemplary service. Uh, it is our intent, and, and we know that uh, it, it's not our opinion of our service that counts. It's truly the opinion of the customer. We recognize what it means to be able to be best in class. We also value tremendously the opportunity to provide the services, uh, not just in these airports, but in a number of airports across the, the country. Uh, our mission as ABM and as an organization uh, is to make sure that we take, every, take care of everybody every day. And that's been a long-standing mission of ours for a number of years. We fully intend to recognize all the existing employees as we transition them as well. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and Thank you, Mr. Brownfield. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Our next speaker is Lauren Cohen. Cohen, I'm sorry, Ms. Cohen. Welcome. Mayor and Pro Tem and Council Members, my name is Laura Kanan, oh, President and CEO of Sunshine Cleaning Systems. I want to express my appreciation and gratitude to our entire team at CLT, whom we greatly value and who provides 10 years of dedicated service to the airport. I am asking Council to not approve the proposed contract with ABM and instead to follow through with Brent Cagle's recommendation in a July 30th memo to City Council. You have this document. Mr. Cagle states, upon review of the proposal by the committee, it was determined that pricing information received from vendors was inconsistent. Aviation and procurement management reviewed the pricing criteria in the RFP and concluded it would be in the best interest of the city to clarify and better define pricing criteria in a new request for proposal. The memo goes on to say that, that, that issuing a new RFP will result in a more equal playing field for vendors and a clear understanding of pricing. Instead of issuing a new RFP, as was recommended, staff requested a best and final offer, which caused more confusion with proposers as it lacked clear instruction. We agree with Mr. Cagle's initial recommendation. To correct the process and to improve the outcome, the new RFP must include, first, a clear scoring method for evaluation of price. Price was not even scored in this procurement with the award to the highest bidder. ABM's first price was 12.5 million higher than our bid over five years. CLT's mission states it will be the preferred airport and airline hub by providing the highest quality product for the lowest possible price. Second, define a clear MWSBE goal. We took this RFP at face value when it stated the participation goal was to be negotiated. Most RFPs clearly state the desired participation goal. 
As a prime contractor, we were unsure how our WBE certification status would work in this RFP. We know that city policy is evolving to correct inequities when contracting with minor owned, minority owned businesses. I agree and support this 100%, but believe a woman owned business with a local office for the last past 10 years has more value over a global, publicly traded, multi-billion dollar company. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Kanan. <laughs> we have Sharice Jenkins speak, followed by Dominique uh, Kvejgen. Good evening, Mayor Pro Team and Council Members. My name is Sharice Jenkins, and I would thank you for the opportunity just to share a little bit of my experience working with Sunshine Cleaning. I have been employed with Sunshine Cleaning inside the airport for the last 10 years. I started with Sunshine as their assistant project manager. I'm currently the project manager and have managed almost 300 plus employees. What I would like to say is, in support of Sunshine's recommendation, Sunshine is a company with high expectations, family oriented, trustworthy, and cares about their employees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are you Mr. Yeah, so Mr. Dominique Kovijan. Excuse me for butchering that name. I apologize. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm here to support uh, Sunshine recommendation for this, the contract at the airport. I started with uh, Sunshine Young since uh, 2010 like a crew leader. Two years later, I was promoted uh, at the position of uh, tech chief uh, supervisor. I was, uh, I was on this position uh, since uh, 2018. And 2018, uh, I was promoted uh, at the position of uh, assistant or project manager. What I want to say here, at Sunshine, uh, at Sunshine, everybody got the opportunity to climb the career ladder from the scratch. If uh, you are dedicated, you are hardworking, they give you the opportunity to grow uh, for the company if, uh, the monthly uh, training video, the uh, PowerPoint we receive every time to train on the employee to, perf to have uh, the high performance and to meet uh, the customer need. Uh, just what I want to tell you my story before Sunshine today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alicia Tatum here, and followed by Lawrence Varpilla. Good evening. My name is Alicia Tatum. I'm the Senior Director for Employment Services at Lifespan. We are a nonprofit agency that has partnered with the Charlotte Douglas International Airport for over 13 years. And we've been privileged that when Sunshine came on 10 years ago, that they supported our folks in making sure that equal opportunity was a reality for folks with varying disabilities. What that means is Sunshine has been committed over the last 10 years to make sure that their interviews and their screening process and their training process includes people, every person who wants to work and can work in the job. That's not a small feat when you're a large company, but they've been so committed to it that in the last um, nine years that they have raised over $100,000 for employment training programs right here in the Charlotte area to make sure that if you've got a disability and you wanna work, that you've got a shot. 
it's really important that we have more employers in this city that understand that commitment. And so I wanted to come here today and make sure you knew just about how civic oriented and community invested this company is. And hopefully that you'll give them another chance to do their good work um, and be a compassionate and responsible employer in our city. Thanks so much. Thank you. Mr. Varpilla, followed by Mr. Herbert Perry. My name is Lawrence Varpilla. I'm an employee at Sunshine Clinic uh, System. I started working with the company uh, in 2015 when I was in school. Uh, they gave me the opportunity to go to school at the same time work. I started as an entry level general cleaner and I moved on to an area lead. I got promoted later on to assistant supervisor and later on promoted to be a supervisor of a second shift. Um, I have been able to purchase my home while working for Sunshine. Uh, at Sunshine, we believe in diversity. As you can hear from the viewers uh, I sent over here, they believe in diversity. No matter where you come from, your culture, your orientation, you are given an opportunity to excel. So um, I'm here to support whatever our, our leader is saying. And also at Sunshine, the culture allows people to be a first line uh, security. I remember like 2017, one of our employees saw another guy uh, actually taking a, a handgun, uh, planning to, to, to harm his friend. He, went, he quickly went and informed the security and he got apprehended. So. Uh, Sunshine is a company that allows everyone um, to strive for, for, for higher height. So that is why I'm here. Thank you. Mr. Perry, <clears throat> welcome. Good evening, everyone. I'm a native of Charlotte, North Carolina. I was born and raised here. I'm a jack of all trades and a master at none. But coming to work with Sunshine, I have learned to be a leader. I started off in uh, 2009 as a restroom attendant, and I climbed my way up to a third shift uh, manager now. And I'm involved with over 60 people on a daily basis. I just want to let you know I've never been at a job more than 10 years until I got here. Um, they are a good group of people. They came from Florida. They welcomed us with open arms when they first got here, and we provided them with a service that was uh, unique. And uh, I tell everybody, just remember, when you get here, you're in the janitorial service. But that means that we're polite to people, we're kind to people, and we go above and beyond what we're supposed to do. Uh, in saying this, I support this company. I hope that you would have this company stay on at least five more years. And uh, we have a lot of people that support this company, and we just want to be around here in Charlotte as long as we can. Thank you for letting me speak. Our last two speakers are Mr. Javier um, or Xavier Johnson and David Dyrick. So if you'd like to both come down. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Johnson. Good evening, Council. My name is Xavier Johnson. I am the first shift supervisor of Sunshine Cleaning Systems at Charlotte Douglas International. I was first want to start with my journey. I've been working with the company a little over 10 years. Uh, right before then, I had dropped out of college, with my, which my mother had beat me up for. <laughs> but I could honestly say I've gained another family within Sunshine. Uh, Ms. Sharice Jenkins, Dominique, Mr. Roger, Mrs. Laura, Dave, they instill things within us that we always respect each other, we treat each other how we want another person to treat us. And I could say that Sunshine is a great value to the airport for the simple fact of when there's any type of emergency that happens, sometimes it might be short staff on security or CMPD. I'll give you an example. Thanksgiving week, the airport was slammed. It was packed. Um, so operations called around 1030 in the morning. He said, excuse me, sir, would you mind if you would have one of your staff members go over to a certain gate? 
retrieve an iPad for us because we're short staffed on security. And I, I don't want to make you know a long story, but I'm just saying I have to say, Sunshine is not just a company that comes and cleans the airport every day. Anything that we're asked to do, we do it 100% with a smile, and we're always in good spirits. So I would like for the council, members of the city, to take this into consideration that we are a company that is a great value to the airport, and I hope that everybody takes this into to consideration. And please, let's try to extend the contract further than what it is right now. And thank you for taking the time to listen to us. We really appreciate you. Mr. Derek, welcome. Mayor Pro Tem, thank you. Thank you, City Council members, for this opportunity. I'm Dave Dyrick, and I'm here with a few of our employees. Could Team Sunshine please stand up? Thank you. We're not here as sore losers. We're here, with all due respect, to correct the process and outcome we believe was not in the best interest of the city. I worked with the transition team in 2010 when we were first awarded the contract and have continued to support the team. A lot of changes occurred that first year, and frankly, a lot of work went into changing the culture of the team we inherited. Our approach has always been to create a positive environment that fosters employee growth, professional development, and a customer service focus. We set hiring practices that support the most qualified candidates, set standards for conduct, provide uniforms our employees wear with pride, and create a friendly, supportive, and safe environment where employees care about each other. And over the past 10 years, our stewardship has resulted in minimal labor issues and zero OSHA violations at CLT. I believe we've been successful in creating a positive workplace and consider our staff an extension of the Sunshine family, and we believe the feeling is mutual. I'm here to support Brett Cagle's July 30th memo recommending a new RFP that we would believe would correct the process and improve the outcome. But it must clearly define a plan for pay equity and an approach of gradually increasing pay rates. We support a $15 an hour wage rate. In our tenure at CLT, pay rates were always approved annually by CLT staff based on a budget. We've raised the issue of pay inequality many times and requested pay increases to help close the pay gap that exists between our work and that of similar jobs at the airport. And we don't believe it's fair to list current pay rates which occurred in this RFP and not expect the proposers to follow those pay rates when price is clearly listed as one of the evaluation criteria. The other day, while walking through Concourse C, I encountered several of our team members going about their work. They were diligently doing what they were trained to do. Some were interacting with the public. And even though it was at the end of their shift, I couldn't help noticing how sharp and professional they looked and acted. And I thought to myself, this is what our CLT customers and the traveling public see on a daily basis. It was really a prideful moment for us. And we believe that Sunshine's corporate values of respect, trust, teamwork, innovation, and safety provide the backbone for our success here in Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to ask um, our airport director, Mr. Cagle, to come down and address the council and address the speakers. Good evening, Brent Cagle, aviation director. Would you like me to address some of the yes, things I've heard, or are there specific questions? To ask you to address any of the comments that were made prior to the council. Yes, so uh, one of the comments was uh, made twice, or at least twice, by Sunshine uh, representatives. Um, one is that they uh, would like me to, or like the council, myself, to follow the memo. Uh, that memo was written. That memo I signed. Um, you also note that that memo requires the signature of the city manager. That memo was a draft memo and was never sent to the city manager's office for approval. The reason that is, is we opted for a different path. 
clarifying questions throughout the process so that we could continue moving forward. And that is exactly what we did. I'll also note that the entire RFP process provides ample opportunity for questions and answers throughout the process, both in the beginning of the process and throughout. We received over 100 questions throughout this process. All of those were answered and all of the answers were made available to all proposers or all potential proposers. So any kind of confusion or lack of clarity would, it would be normal part of the process for the proposers or potential proposers to ask those questions so that we can respond and that's exactly what we did or the Aviation Department's procurement team throughout. The other thing I want to say is I agree. Sunshine Cleaning has been a part of the Aviation Department for 10 years and they have provided good service. We are not or did not launch this RFP process because there was a service issue associated with the current vendor with Sunshine Cleaning. Sunshine Cleaning initially had a five-year contract which looked like three, a three-year contract with two one-year extensions. Upon completion of that contract, we did an RFP. And Sunshine Cleaning won the second RFP. Again, a three-year contract with two one-year extensions. This was the end of that second uh, contract. And we did an RFP, an open competition for all companies who chose to propose to compete for the, for the business. This is a significant contract. It is over... It, was, it is basically approximately a million dollars a month of service. And quite frankly, it is one of the most important contracts we have when it comes to passenger experience and customer experience in the term, terminal. The hundreds of employees who clean the terminal, who uh, are restroom attendants in the terminal, they interact with our passengers, 125,000 people daily, more than myself, Jack Christine, our Chief Operating Officer, ever will because they are in the terminal every single day. So it is very important to us to have the best quality provider. In this instance, I believe and the Evaluation Committee believes that the best proposal provided when it comes to quality of service and price overall for a value is ABM. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cagle. With that, I'm going to ask for a motion to approve a contract extension. Oh, excuse me. A motion to approve a contract extension with it's three parts. There are three parts. Uh, with Sunshine Cleaning Systems on a month to month basis, not to extend beyond June 30th, 2020, for janitorial services and approve a contract with ABM Aviation Inc. for janitorial services for an initial term of three years and authorize the city manager to renew the contract with ABM A Aviation Inc. for up to two one-year terms with possible price adjustments and to amend the contract consistent with the purpose for which the contract has approved, was approved. May I have a motion? Which approved. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Sajmira? Thank you, Madam Mayor Putem. Oh, when you have over 50 out of 300 employees praising their employer, you know there is something special. Uh, they must be doing something right. So we appreciate uh, the relationship that you have with your employees is truly special. I can't say that about every employer. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, Mr. Cagle and I have had s several conversations about this. I want to ask you some of those questions so that folks in the audience can listen to and the folks that are watching from home can also listen to uh, responses. Uh, what is the difference, what is the gap amount between the lowest bid and the ABM's bid? So, the, so these are not bids. A bid would indicate that low price or price is the only factor. Um, these are proposal, proposals. The lowest proposal was roughly $10.5 million. That was not Sunshine's, as far as compensation goes, that was not Sunshine's proposal. It was, a, it was one of the other 12 proposers that we received proposals from um, as compared to ABM's $12.5 million. That is their negotiated uh, contract value as you see in front of you, roughly speaking. 
So what is the what is the gap amount between the proposal for from Sunshine compared to the ABM? About eight hundred thousand dollars annually. Eight hundred thousand dollars a year. Correct. Okay. Um, and I know from our conversations, you had mentioned uh, one of the criteria was, uh, or one of the better uh, criteria was the pay rate and the benefits. So what is the pay difference uh, between two companies? So based on their pricing sheets associated with the uh, minimum pay per job, generally speaking, ABM is proposed approximately 30 to 40 cents more per hour as a minimum pay rate across the board for all of the different job classes, generally speaking. Okay. So I, I calculated just on average 40 cents, just take the highest, 40 cents per employee um, with 350 employees that ABM had proposed, you're looking at about $291,000 a year difference uh, compared to $800,000 more uh, in the proposal that ABM had submitted. <clears throat> what are additional benefits that uh, ABM is proposing that Sunshine doesn't currently offer? So included in the proposal that ABM provided, there were um, several there, the, the basic health insurance and days off are basically the same, They're very similar. If not the same, they are very similar. Where the difference comes is in ABM's approach to training and the investment that they make in the employees through their training program. Um, I will also say that ABM in their proposal will also be bringing in um, dedicated staff to Charlotte, to the Charlotte market, for things like basically human resources functions. So um, employee retention, employee training, employee recruitment, those types of things. But that's where it really stood out to the evaluation committee was in their other benefits, in their training, in their cash incentives, in their other programs that they utilize. I guess the way I would characterize it is they, util they invest in those employees in ways that make them better and more marketable as they go through their career. It's more than a job, it's a career. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cagle. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily agree with you on that. When you have over 15% of the employees praising their employer and saying that they've provided flexibility, great training, where there is a uh, really good employee retention, um, and considering especially when you look at the pay difference, there is about $291,000 a year when ABM is charging city over $800,000 a year. That's not translating 100% uh, into employee payout. And that's a concern I have, and it's a big conglomerate uh, versus a company that is family-oriented, uh, have relationship with the employees, provides flexibility. Uh, one great example was the flexibility when it came to uh, pursue education. Um, I mean, I remember my days uh, working at a motel as a, as a maid uh, because it provided the flexibility that other jobs wouldn't provide. Um, I, I think these are some of these benefits that far outweighs um, the benefits that ABM offers, and I would not support it. Um, I would not support um, the proposal going to the ABM. So, thank you, Mr. Winston. Um, I have a, a question for Mr. Bromfield. Field. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Winston. Did you? Oh, okay. You have a question yeah, for, wait for yes. him to get to the yeah. back turn. Yes, sir. Oh. Um, th those WMSBE goals that you've committed to, they were not in the original bid package, correct? Like they were not stated in the original big bid package. Uh, the 30%? Correct. 
So that was an opportunity for us to negotiate. We actually did include the 30 percent in the original bid package, yes, sir. Oh, excuse me, the original RFP. So it was not a, it was not a stated goal. Mm -hmm. We took it upon ourselves to actually commit 30 percent, which is pretty standard practice for us in the janitorial services and within ABM. So uh, you might have just answered my second question was how did you arrive to those go that, that number and um, how did you arrive to deciding to get there and how did you go about um, achieving those goals? Yeah, so, uh, so we actually have five business inclusion partners and we, we focus on uh, always trying to at a very minimum come in at 30 percent, which is what we targeted for us as ABM as we work to put together our proposal and our response. So it's normal practice, standard practice for us. Uh, to target at least a 30 percent. Some others we've done a little more, some others, um, depending on the requirement of the RFP, we've come in a little less than that, 25. But quite frankly, we really try to look to get to 30 percent, which is what we proposed here. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions for um, Lauren and, um, and David. Um, how, thank you again for, for coming. Thank um, you. How many times have you uh, and or Sunshine gone through an RFP process uh, with CLT Aviation? This is our third RFP process for the janitorial contract. Um, Sunshine also has three other contracts that we have gone through the RFP process with CLT. Um, those two contracts, one is for ramp side, um, surface cleaning, one is for the surface cleaning on the front side, the streets, the parking lots. And we also do the terrazzo floor contract at CLT, which is different from the janitorial contract. So ABM would not be responsible for the terrazzo floor contract. Sunshine would continue to have that contract. We're in our, in our second year of a five-year contract. Uh, was, was this RP process different than others? This RFP process was very similar to our previous two RFPs. In both this contract and the previous two, it was a one-year bid with a management fee contract. So it did not ask for a five-year price. That is what was really confusing when I was speaking earlier. It, staff came back late in the game after all the bids were turned in and ask all proposers to give a best and final fixed price, five-year price. We only were required to give a one-year price. So that was very confusing for us proposers as we went through that process. Sunshine stayed exactly where our price was. ABM came off of their price in, in their contract for their first year, 1.5 million. There were several contractors who came down 20,000 and 50,000, but Sunshine stayed right at their original price. And then we increased that price three, um, one percent in the second year, one and a half in the third. We increased the fourth year, um, two and then two and a half percent in the fifth year. Uh, do you uh, feel uh, that ABM has received an unfair advantage during this RFP process over you and the other bidders? I really do because, and I'm going to go back to the MWSBE percentage, because that contract stated that the, that percentage would be negotiated. I received a phone call from staff asking what our, our percentage was. And this was very confusing for us because Sunshine has recently received our um, W uh, Women Owned Business Certification, HUB certification with the uh, state of, of North Carolina and also the city of Charlotte. So we were not sure how our WBE certification applied to this contract and neither did staff. They had to get back to me on that. So. We were pushed and rushed to try to give our percentage. So what we did is we went with the percentages that we have done in the past. In hindsight, I should have asked more questions and I wish I would have. 
Sunshine has a 35 percent um, minority business um, percentage at the Fort Lauderdale Airport, and we have had between a 25 to 35 percent minority participation for the last 33 years that we have had that contract. So we would love to have a higher percentage, and I wish that um, CLT staff would have negotiated with us as they did, sounds like they did with ABM. One thing with ABM, they have, since their initial proposal, they've reached out to our um, minority providers and have brought them on to their contract. One of them was already included. The second one has been brought on to their contract after the fact, after their initial proposal. I don't have any more questions, but can I ask uh, Mr. Cagle to respond? Because he, petitioners, I mean, uh, Sunshine is saying that he believe we're given an unfair advantage. Okay, let's um, let's go ahead with everybody else's questions first, and then we can come back. Is that? I was going to directly respond to. Uh, what all right, go ahead, Thomas Mr. Said. Winston. Go ahead. You can respond. Yes. Renee has a question. Oh, go ahead, Mr. I have a follow-up question. Let's go on it first. Yes. So um, my response has been uh, I do not agree with Ms. Kanan uh, at all. Um, I've never met Ms. Kanan, but I will say her company has provided service for 10 years. I do not believe that this RFP gave any company an unfair advantage over another. Uh, if I did, I would have sent the memo for different reasons to Mr. Jones. Um, I do not believe that. What I will also say is Ms. Kanan continues to talk about um, she wishes that she had or if it had only been this way. An RFP process is the opportunity for the company to put their best proposal forward to provide the best quality of service at the best pricing possible. ABM did not, um, so another normal pop process of an RFP is to find the best provider, the recommended provider, and then to negotiate. And quite frankly, at the original proposed value that ABM initially had in their proposal, it was too high. We were very concerned about that. But it was also clear throughout the three uh, independent reviews by the evaluation committee and through reviews from the executive team at the airport that ABM represented the highest quality of service. But their initial price was too high. We issued a letter of intent, which then allows us to start to negotiate with ABM. It does not mean that we ultimately would have had to come here and make this recommendation tonight. It means that we can start to negotiate with the company. And if we don't come to terms, then we would move on to another company. In this case, that would have been Sunshine because they were the second company that we had um, identified. However, ABM, through those negotiations, what we found, and we were very clear about this in those negotiations, is while we didn't like their price, we absolutely loved the rest of the uh, proposals, proposal that they had, the quality of service, the way that they treated training for their staff. So we said, without diminishing those things in the proposal that are important to us, where can we end up on price? And what we found was ABM, because of their unfamiliar familiarity with the airport, they had built into their initial proposal some contingencies. Some, some amounts for unknown items that may come up. As we worked through that with them, that's where those savings came. They did not reduce the quality of the services that they initially proposed on. And I will say, one of my frustrations throughout this, I was not in the in-person interviews, but um, there was a panel of aviation staff, uh, American Airlines staff, HMS host and parity staff who participated throughout this. And one of the things that they found frustrating, and frankly, I do too, was um, Sunshine basically stating that in Fort Lauderdale, they had lower rates of attrition, higher employee morale, and they attributed that to higher pay. And then when asked if there was one thing you could change about Charlotte, they stated higher pay. As frustrating for me as the aviation director, 
because we asked them to propose the way that they would want to provide that service. And it, and it appears, based on the conversation tonight and the interview, that that's not what they did. And that's frustrating because, again, as I said, they have not provided bad service for the 10 years. But this process is a normal part of the process, and the information that they provided and the proposers provided, ABM came out on top. And that's what we have to go on in these proposals, not what we know of the company over the last 10 years, but what they provided it to us during this process. Mayor Pro Tem, may I respond? Uh, no, I'm sorry, we can't do it that way. We do have other council members that wish to speak and perhaps that'll, their questions will elicit that. So we're going to go to Mr. Bakari. Thank you, Brent, this one's for you. And um, first, um, nothing, uh, I'll speak for myself at least, um, in the time I've worked with you over the last term leads me to believe um, that you would not run a process on an RFP transparently, ethically, and in a balanced form. So uh, I start under that under that premise. The question I have, and we've talked briefly on this as well beforehand, is clearly there's the large level kind of decisions on an RFP and the overriding companies. But specifically, when we think about the hundreds of employees that are actually executing that work in an excellent manner and have been doing so for 10 plus years, are there opportunities rather than uh, everyone kind of transitioning, are there opportunities for those folks to maybe have a special process to apply for the new job? Should we approve them today? Pending the outcome of tonight, yes. Uh, ABM has already committed to that. Oh. Uh, in fact, they will be working, pending the outcome of tonight and the B and the C actions, um, they will be immediately working with the Aviation Department and Sunshine to immediately start to um, discuss like the transition specifically with the employees, um, the employees who are here tonight and with the rest of the employees who are not. And while, while it's a tough situation, I think that if we can make sure that that, that is structured, and I'll ask this group who seems to have said some passionate words tonight to do that really in a thoughtful manner because it could be in a bad situation the best of both worlds where um, we uh, get to take some of those increased um, trainings and uh, higher salaries and all the kinds of things that we've desired and enable those um, to not have to suffer who've just done the right things their entire time. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. So that was my question. Um, if the service is the same and the employees will be the same and some of the subcontractors are the same, how are we measuring the quality? Is that through the training that the ABM has proposed? That is, that is the primary area or one of the primary areas where their proposal stands out, so yes. Now, ABM also has a way for the aviation department and for them to report us to us in a um, measurable way the results of that training, right? So training is only as good as the customer experience that it, that it then allows the employees to provide. And ABM, they call it the ABM way, um, and they have mechanisms for gauging that, um, those interactions of their staff, the airport staff, the janitorial staff with airport customers. And then did the employees know that they were, um, that they would be getting an average of 30 to 40 cent per hour raise? Do you know? I, I do, do know not that? know. I, I do not know if the current Sunshine employees are aware of the details of the possible new contract with ABM. I would assume that they are not aware of that. Laura, do you know if they knew that? Um, I do not believe our employees knew that. One thing I do want you to know that as part of the extension agreement that's also on your agenda today, we uh, requested a 3% increase for all employees. And this will put our lowest pay rate for our employees over ABM's lowest pay rate in their proposal. Say that again. So the extension that's on your on the agenda tonight, that we requested a 3% increase for employee pay in the extension agreement. It's 
And the reason that we requested that was so that our employees would have pay equity. And we are now our lowest paid employee uh, starting, and we've requested that this take effect January 1, our lowest paid employee is going to be at $10 an hour. So, which is going to be more than what ABM's lowest paid employee is. So, we have um, requested this through um, Kevin Lynch, who is our direct report at aviation and aviation maintenance. So, there you go. And so, that would just be temporarily through the extension or? That would be our pay rate through the extension period. So, whatever ABM does after that, it could be a reduction in pay to our employees based on their existing proposal. Can I ask a follow-up? I do have one question. Let's go. Um, we've got Mr. Mitchell. We still have council members who haven't asked questions yet, so let's go ahead and ask Mr. Mitchell, go ahead. Are you done, Ms. Johnson? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mr. Mitchell. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, you can stay there, but because I have a question for you and I have a question for Sean. So can you come back to the podium, please, sir? So Sean, uh, go ahead, sir. You want him so, first? Yes. So Sean, one of my concerns is those employees who sit here proudly with their blue suits on and talking about a great experience they have in the airport. Our airport director mentioned that you you have offered uh, if this thing get approved that you will hire them. Will you hire some of them or you will hire all of them? Uh, we actually have a 90-day commitment to uh, transition all of the workforce over. Um, and as we transition them over, we'll be providing them not only with uh, those positions that they're in today, we'll be honoring their rate of pays. We'll also be honoring their shifts and their days off. One thing that we've recognized and realized that's most important to people, people believe it's always pay, but I think more important to most employees is what does my shift look like, what are my days off, and oh, by the way, how does my seniority play into that too? That's a very important piece for employees. And we have committed to honor that. Uh, obviously, we'll verify seniority to ensure that all of it is accurate. But for us, that's about providing uh, not just a career, but also an opportunity for those employees in, in the organization to be able to have lives outside of that, right? We, we are all about developing and growing people, not just professionally, but personally as well. And we are extremely flexible when it comes to looking at what, they, what exists today and what benefits they get around those hours, shift schedules, time off, and then seniority. Um, and anybody who's worked in a, a capacity of, of as an hourly employee recognizes how important that is. So, yes, sir, we have the commitment to do that. Okay, thank you. And, and one more, there was a comment, there was a comment made about uh, a minority firm that was not part of your original proposal, but you added them after the fact. What, what company were they referring to? So we actually have five companies, business inclusion partners, that actually are all here today represented. And I wonder if we could we just take a minute to have them introduce themselves? No, no, no? Ju just, okay. a, just a direct question. Mayor Pro Tem is not so, going to allow me to you get me in trouble to Mayor Pro Tem. I, I understand. I understand. I don't want to get you into trouble. Right. No, sir. So, so what, yes, could you answer the question? What company was not a part of your original participation, but later on you added them? So I'm not quite certain which company they're referring to. Okay. Uh, but I will tell you that we've been communicating with any and all uh, business inclusion partners that potentially were either on the contract or have operated in this environment prior to, uh, trying to secure that 30 percent to ensure that we had the right partners, right? We did not just focus on any specific business partner. We focused on everybody that was at that walkthrough, that was at the meetings and the sessions, and looked for opportunities for us to build a, a very solid team that we could come to the city of Charlotte and, and the uh, Charlotte Airport with uh, as a strong proposal. And we felt that these five uh, were exceptional partners and uh, had vast depth of experience that could add value to us and all of us and our customers. Thank you. Yes, sir. Lauren, if, if I may. You know, we talk around the dais about uh, participation. We, we do pride ourselves on um, women participation and African-American participation. And a lot of times you get more participation and you have to pay for more. I think it's a reality we, we realize here at council. 
I guess the question I have for you, uh, you are a prime and you are a woman, but why not uh, reach, you have 35 percent participation at Florida International, why not reflect that same model here at the airport? What prevented you from doing that? It wasn't that we wanted, we didn't want to do that. When the proposal came out, it said to be negotiated with no true percentage. So we were waiting for okay. the city of Charlotte to say, you know, for this contract, we would like to have 25%. The RFP that was out in Fort Lauderdale, it very clearly stated in the RFP that this, there will be a 35% subcontract small business percentage. So we were waiting for what was the negotiation that was going to happen. And all they did, they asked us what was our percentage. We, we went with what we have done in the past 10 years, which has never been brought to our attention that we should increase that. So if there was something different that we should have done, it should have been brought by staff to us and negotiated at a higher percentage. I would have loved to have negotiated that rate if I was asked. You know, and one last comment, and I'm just speak for myself. Uh, this is a very uncomfortable position for, for me. Uh, one, um, we value the airport as our big economic asset. Uh, at the same time, I think this dais, we try to be as fair and make sure we have a good reputation that you can do business in the city of Charlotte, the fairway. Uh, and then you didn't come, you've been there 10 years with no customers, uh, bad customer service experience. Um, and then you still got two other contracts that's out there at the airport. Three. Three. Um, I think collaboration is the key. And, and, and this feels very uneasy uh, just for me that uh, we have someone who's been out there, we have someone who's going to have three contracts, and yet we we stand here today, and I feel like I'm going to choose a losers and. and I, that's just my editorial, and it feels uncomfortable that we're in this position. I'm sorry you feel uncomfortable. I felt like it was my role as president and CEO of Sunshine to step up and explain our position to you. Uh, I know that in the future that there will be several vendors who probably already have uh, responded to this RFP that are going to take a second thought about responding to a janitorial RFP here because of this process. I've spoken personally with several different companies um, that have major concerns about the how this procurement was followed and exactly what happened, including the, the biggest thing is that price was never scored and never shown anywhere as a score. If price is one of the four criteria that you're evaluating an RFP on, there is no reason that that price should not be scored. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Watlington. Sure. So much of what's already been said, uh, Echo, um, I do want to hit a couple of things. First, that I do also want to acknowledge that what uh, Sunshine employees have said, I absolutely appreciate that you all have provided great service, and even um, our staff has said that you've all provided great service for the last 10 years. So I definitely acknowledge that. Um, in reading the RFP documents that you all provided, as well as I requested additionally from the city, um, from from what I understand and from what I hear today, this was a best value option analysis versus a low cost option. Um, I do recognize that your position that you just stated that had, pr had price been scored in a particular way, it would have gone a different way. However, I did not see any evidence of the RFP not being followed in the sense that price was considered as it related to overall quality and value. Um, as a matter of principle, I appreciate that, especially for our enterprise funds, that our staff is committed and obligated to run their business. So as long as it fits within your P&L, just from a principal standpoint, I, I lean to support that. Um, however, my greatest concern, as some of my colleagues have echoed here, is for the um, employees of Sunshine. And I want to make sure, because I did not get the sense that everyone was aware of the, obviously, that they weren't necessarily aware of what ABM's um, 
offerings were. I just want to read it for the record. Uh, I'll be brief, I promise. Um, ABM's proposal was higher cost than Sunshine's due to additional average hourly pay for their staff, additional employee benefits, including a 401k program and employee financial incentive program, hiring an on-site employee retention manager, a more robust training program for their staff, additional technology tools for reporting service issues, additional janitorial staff, a secret shopper program to ensure quality service and other quality control measures. And I do uh, see here the, the, uh, C, the QCP. Um, the other piece here about ABM committing to hiring 100% of the Sunshine staff and providing them with training uh, helps me come to a place of, this for me feels like who moved my cheese, right? It's definitely a situation, it sounds like, where had all of the information been known in terms of what the other person was going to provide that you would have responded differently. Unfortunately, that's just not the way business necessarily works. As of course, I know you understand that you've been in this a long time. I don't mean to demean you in any way. With that being said, I do believe that I will be supporting the recommendation of staff today, but I appreciate the information that you've provided. Um, and I look forward to continuing to work with you in the, with the three other contracts and in five years, we'll do this again. Thank you, Mr. Driggs. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say uh, I think Sunshine is a likable company. We met and talked. You're a family business. Uh, so I, I have sympathy with the distress you're experiencing about this. Um, and it, it's a tough call. Uh, I will, however, kind of remind everybody the airport is the, the crown jewel of Charlotte. Lowest uh, cost per plane passenger, second biggest hub of the largest airline in the world. And these are the people who delivered that. These are the people who run that for us. And so, as I explained to you in our meeting, uh, I have a fundamental reluctance <coughs> to kind of have this body go in and second guess a business decision that was made by those managers, by those people who have delivered those results for us. And I would feel that it was appropriate for a council to do so if I thought there was some impropriety, a conflict of interest, or a situation like that where we felt morally obliged to kind of, you know, defend the reputation of the city. But the situation I was in was hearing a little bit of a kind of he said, she said, back and forth uh, between the parties. And it, it struck me that if we don't spend a lot of time as a group walking through the whole RFP process, talking to the airline, which I've done, uh, and, 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 and really get to the bottom of all of these issues back and forth, I don't know how we can arrive at a conclusion that's different from the people that work for us and run the airport. So on that basis, uh, even though I understand the emotion that uh, supports or would want to defend Sunshine, uh, I feel that our allegiance to our managers is greater. I had one question for Mr. Cagle. A, a lot of what has been said about this whole thing sounded like a process issue. It sounded like uh, <clears throat> there were certain expectations about how the RFP should work, and it didn't work that way, and so on, and you had responses to that. But what is your feeling if this whole thing were redone and all of the issues that have been raised have been addressed about the likelihood that you might arrive at a different conclusion from the one you arrived at at the end of this process? The evaluation committee reviewed the paper, the proposals, twice, and then they did in-person in interviews with both ABM and Sunshine, and they came to the same conclusion regarding the quality of the service on all three occasions. The primary sticking point with this the whole way has been price. And quite frankly, as I've said, um, I myself was concerned with price. This is a very large contract. So to Ms. Kanan's point, I can assure her that we did not go into this recommendation tonight lightly or without considering price. We did not score price the way that she thought or maybe expected us to, but the RFP document never stated a methodology or anything else on how a how price or any of the other items were going to be scored or weren't going to be scored for that matter. We evaluated price in context of what could we afford. 
and can we afford the best value? Quite frankly, I think we t went about it just like all of us do in our daily lives. We looked at the best quality and then we tried to decide, can we afford that? Is it something that we want to spend the money on to create that customer experience? And that's what we did. I mean, I'm assuming, for example, that you didn't need to spend a lot of time reaching the conclusion that the $10 million contract would not have been a good outcome for us. That is correct. And, and so, so that's a bit of a reflection of the role that <coughs> price pays in these things. So I will be supporting management's recommendation. Thank you. Mr. Graham. Thank you, Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. And we've been sitting here for a while discussing contract, and that's, that is a little bit uneasy because, again, this is really kind of getting in the weeds and the details a lot uh, where we hire our professional staff to kind of do the uh, do the grunt work for us, for lack of a better word. But just a quick question, all, all things being equal, and, and I think they are, wh why did you price pay the way you did? I'm just, just kind of curious. Yes. Why what? Why did I'm you sorry. price your pay scale the way you did in your no proposal? So all we, things being equal, and I think everything really is, yes. really is equal. So we, we were under the impression, based on the four criteria of selection, that price would be scored. And this, the janitorial industry, especially for aviation, is a very, very competitive industry. There are companies that, that's all they bid, is janitorial, including Sunshine and ABM, although we bid other things. So we initially had a 3% increase in the pay rate for our employees. And we ended up taking that back to the price that we're currently paying. Our employees received a pay raise in November of 18, a 3% increase. So we, when this initially came out and we submitted our one year price, we said, okay, they just got a raise. We'll go, we'll ask for an increase the second year because that's the way this budgeting process has been for the last 10 years. You request an increase, it goes through the budgeting process, and through that budgeting process, it's approved or not approved. So our, since we thought price was going to be scored, we wanted our price to be competitive to keep this airport. It's that important to us. We love every single person sitting up here. They are our family, and we are their family, and we wanted to stay here in Charlotte, so we thought we needed to have a competitive price. Well, thank you for the response. Um, again, uh, I think Councilman um, Victoria kind of laid out the case for um, taking care of the employees, and that's at the end of the day, whether the vote goes either way, I want to make sure that the employees are, are, are made whole uh, and uh, um, that they can move forward um, with some level of certainty. Um, I, again, I, I, I commend both parties. Um, we're really, as a council, are in the weeds right now, for sure. Um, but I think it's important enough to, to have this conversation um, based on our priorities in terms of uh, giving considerations to small and women-owned businesses, uh, and certainly a 10-year incumbent deserves the, 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 um, the opportunity to, um, to make a case. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Um, I'll just say briefly that um, I, too, like my colleagues, are concerned about the well-being and the livelihood of the employees. Um, but I will mention, Mr. Cagle, um, if you can confirm this, that these were not the only two companies that submitted bids, twelve. correct? So there were 12. Oh. So clearly, these two are the very best companies. And that, that says a lot about the fact that we're even having this discussion tonight, is the quality of the, the organizations that you run. And that's why it makes it really hard. Mm -hmm. That said, I am also uncomfortable with this conversation. We have a council manager form of government where we hire a manager and we ask him to manage his staff and he asks his staff to run their businesses, in the, especially in the case of an enterprise fund. Um, I don't know that I have the expertise to second guess the evaluation committee, the executive team, and the aviation staff. And so having this conversation 
you all have mentioned feels uncomfortable. I think it it does to me as well, even though there, there's points that you could pick at and say, well, what about this and what about that? But that is the form of government we have. It doesn't just affect this decision. It affects every contract that our staff spends time negotiating. And so I, I, I feel that I need to honor that process because I don't see that the process violated the policies that we as a, as a council pass. And so with that, I'm going to support the um, aviation team's decision. Yeah, I have a question. Okay, Ms. Ajmira and then Mr. Winston. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, there was something that um, was uh, said by Ms. Laura. Uh, so you said with extension that Sunshine is already offering a higher pay per hour than what ABM's proposal is, which is the minimum is ten dollars per, per hour. Correct. Okay, and would that would that continue uh, till the contract ends? That would continue pr most likely through a, a three-year term, um, unless there was negotiation opportunities, um, you know, for the other terms, the other. Um, so, I'm not. I'm not. I'm. At, I'm kind of at a loss whether this is going to be a management contract moving forward like we've had for the last 10 years or if this is going with the fixed price contract that's never been conveyed conveyed to me so I, I think you answered my question I just wanted to make sure so what you are offering in the extension that will so that is actually a higher pay than what's been proposed by ABM yes okay that's all I needed to know so there is a higher pay and uh, other question I have for mr. Cagle I just wanted to make sure you had mentioned that, or, or I'm not sure who mentioned, that, that all other employees would be offered an opportunity to apply. But uh, beyond 90 days, uh, are all these 300 employees guaranteed a job that they currently have? No, ABM did not propose that. But I will say that um, after conversations with them, the 90 days is intended to bring them through the training and then to transition into full-time ABM employees. Um, so, so, so this statement that they have made in the RFP is for 90 days, which is the training period. Actually, Mr. Bromfield, uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I think you are. Not someone else. So, so no, as they have proposed, it is 90 days, but the intention is to train them through to ABM way. They, they call it that in their proposal, so that they then are full-time employees of ABM. Got it. So if they don't meet the ABM ways, they may not have a job after 90 days. I don't believe that Sunshine provides. Oh, I think that's it. Okay. And um, so in, in the proposal, I think that's a question for the staff. Do we, I guess in our propose, in our bait when it goes out, is it a standard process where we, where we do not list MWSBE uh, percentage recommendation? Is that a standard process? I, that might be a question for one of our procurement staff. Hi, okay, I'm the Chief Procurement Officer. Uh, we may do this in two ways. You may move forward with a negotiated process or you may set goals so who decides that so uh, in general working with the airport we work with them for many months looking at this process and making decisions about how to best go forward in that process exactly. ultimately exactly. the airport makes that decision with that consultation okay so that's a follow-up question mr. for mr. Cagle why was if the MWSBE participation was so important why was it not part of the process because quite frankly, on a contract this big, we don't want to tell people where the ceiling is. We would rather negotiate afterward and try to push or percent. encourage companies to meet the most possible, yeah. right? Um, and setting a number that's either unrealistic or too low we choose, in this instance, we chose to negotiate this contract or the uh, CBI on this contract because it is such a large contract. Quite frankly, ABM did not need to provide in writing when they proposed 30%. That was not a requirement, but they did. They chose to do that. Now, 
I understand, and, and looking at what Sunshine has provided, it has not been 30%. Now, again, we didn't expect Sunshine or any of the companies to put in what they were going to because it was not a requirement. But quite frankly, we were s pleasantly surprised when ABM did that and they came in at a very strong participation rate. I think that answers my question. Thank you, Mr. Kago. I know it's a difficult conversation to have, but I appreciate your patience over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, that's it. Mr. Winston? I just a uh, quick comment to our, my colleagues, because I've heard a couple of us talk about being uncomfortable. Uh, I think we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and having these conversations uh, because it's clear to me that the conversations that we have had behind this dais on other contracts like this uh, around janitorial services, ar around the willingness to pay more for more equity to our, our um, uh, uh, to our, the employees of our contractors, uh, to, to the conversations that we have had about the ability to reach and exceed goals around MSWBE, I believe that this has informed staff to, that they that they should be willing to, to to look at the way they go about their bid processes, perhaps a little differently, and not be afraid uh, to give us uh, contracts that cost a little more but that attain the goals that we've been talking about and saying. So I think we should take as much time and have as much conversation and not be afraid to ask the necessary questions and get a bit uncomfortable in those weeds and those details because it actually makes a difference, Thank even you. if it is a bit uncomfortable. Sure with that, I'll call the question. So with that, we have a, a first and a second motion. May I have a vote all in favor of uh, items A and B, oh, excuse me, I'm on, of items A, B, and C. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Raise your hands. Hands up. Aye. Any opposed? All right. With Thank that, the, the motion carries. I, I, okay. So Thank you. Uh, with that concludes um, the public hearing for that consent agenda item, and we will move to agenda item number nine which is a open, to open a public hearing for Microsoft Corporation Business Investment Grant. May I have a motion? Um, have excuse me, M Madam Clerk, do we have speakers for? Uh, motion to close the public hearing. Second. All in favor of closing the public hearing for? Uh, aye. 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 Motion to approve uh, item B. Second. You go too fast. <laughs> Let me say <laughs> it. <laughs> Uh, a motion to approve the city's share of the business invis investment grant to Microsoft Corporation for a total estimated amount of $664,403 over seven years. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? This is your tryout. This is <laughs> sharp. <laughs> Somebody's got to stop him from doing that. <laughs> I, I, item number 10 is the analysis of impediments to fair housing. And this, I'm sorry, we've moved to our policy section. Mr. Lark, Mr. Eggleston has moved us right around quite quickly. So we're on item number 10 of policies, an analysis of impediments to fair housing report. We had this presentation uh, at our last meeting. So I'm asking for a motion to approve the analysis of, of impediments to fair housing report. May I have a motion? So moved. Thank you. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Okay, with that, we are on to the city manager's report. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I have no report. Okay. Wow. Approved. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings us to item, uh, agenda item number 12, which is under our business items, and that is to approve the 2020 city council meeting schedules um, and budget to approve the 2020 City Council and Budget Meeting Schedules. May I have to a approve. motion? All in favor? Second. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. The next item is item number 13, the, the, to amend the interlocal agreement with the Water and Sewer Authority of Cabarrus County. The action is to adopt a resolution amending the Water and Sewer Agreement with the Water and Sewer Authority of Cabarrus County to implement and jointly fund the Back Creek Interceptor Project. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Item number 14. Excuse me. 
is um, to appropriate private development funds for traffic signal installations and improvements. The action is to A, approve developer agreements with East Side Connections JV, the Square at South End LLC, Central Piedmont Community College, and South Park Real Estate LLC for traffic signal installations and improvements, and B, adopt a budget ordinance appropriating $193,575 in private developer funds for traffic signal installations and improvements. Motion to approve and adopt. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. Any opposed? Aye. Opposed? <laughs> aye. I said aye. It's just late. got to keep up with this group. <laughs> that wasn't a no. <laughs> Thank you. And that item passes. And that brings us to mayor and city council topics. So why don't we start with Mr. Driggs on that end of the dais? And this is our opportunity for anybody to uh, talk about what's on their mind or if they have any announcements. Not anything on your mind, Mr. Bakari. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter one. We kind of like to stick to topics that um, are relevant to um, upcoming meeting or upcoming talk about whatever events. you want, <laughs> however long you want to talk about it. No speech. Let him start so he can finish. Go ahead, Mr. Drake. <laughs> I'd like to set a good example for everybody else by passing. Thank you. <laughs> Noted. Swap. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. I will not pass, and I would just like to congratulate Mayor Pro Tem Julie Eisler on a wonderful job governing Thank this meeting you. today. Yeah. There were a few areas for improvement. We'll talk about. Them. <laughs> Share the memo later, <laughs> Mr. Graham. Pass. Mr. Wow. Eggleston. Uh, can't pass today. Have to mention. Uh, one of the owners of Brooks Sandwich Shop, who was tragically killed this morning, um, Scott Brooks went in at a little before 5 a.m. this morning to open his restaurant, um, and a 61-year-old father and husband was killed. Uh, we don't have all the details yet, but not only was this a restaurant that is an icon and, uh, and a real landmark in the Nodon neighborhood, but... This is a family who just this summer, uh, many of us were with and got the chance to talk to and know a little better at the Foundation for the Carolinas when they made an announcement that they were making a donation of land that their family owned in Charlotte uh, to go towards helping tackle the affordable housing crisis that we've been so focused on as a city. And um, so great business owners, but even better people. And um, you know, we've got a lot of work to do on violence in this community. We know that. Uh, we take that very seriously. And sometimes I think um, these things can just be statistics. Uh, but today it was somebody that a lot of us knew and somebody who'd been very engaged in the work we're doing. Uh, they should never be statistics, but it certainly wasn't today. And so um, we're thinking about the Brooks family and all of their patrons that knew them and loved them. And uh, we've got to find a way to do better. <laughs> Amen. Larkin, will they be able to reopen, or what's the plan for the restaurant? I don't know under what timeline, but I'm, I, I certainly hope that they, they plan to, to reopen, and uh, I would think that they, they will, but I haven't heard anything yet. Thank you. I want to second the um, sentiments that Mr. Eggleston expressed, um, that it meant a lot to so many people because so many people knew Mr. Brooks and in the, the Brooks Sandwich Shop, but it also highlights the fact that that was a homicide victim that people knew, and people knew the other 102 mm -hmm. victims this year as well. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't diminish what has been taken from other families as well. And I would like to, um, I guess, use that to point to ask this council to please focus more on the fact that we've had 103 homicides this year. That I, there was a statistic mentioned earlier about 33,000. Victims of gun violence in the country, um, but there were 100,000. I think that represents a third of those that didn't die. And we have some in our city as well that are victims of gun violence that didn't die. And so I would challenge our council to push harder to be able to address the, the issue of violent crime in this community in our next term. And not just wait for the data, but start working with our, with our colleagues at the county level, at the CMS level, at the state level and, and in the private sector to do better around the fact that too many people are random victims of violent crime in this community. Thank you. Uh, Thirteen years uh, ago today, 
uh, Joan Higginbotham and six other astronauts went to the space station and spent 13 days uh, correcting solar panels and taking food to the space station. In honor of my lovely queen, I would like to say congratulations, happy anniversary, making sure you can push mankind. Love you, babe. So, so just briefly, we talked about the discussion being uncomfortable. Well, it was very uncomfortable for, uh, for me as the first time voter. So I just want the city employees to know that I do respect the autonomy. Um, but this really was for me about the stewardship and the accountability to the community. So that's why I asked the questions. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm going to take a, a little bit of a, a point of uh, per, personal uh, privilege. Um, I, I moved down to the Carolinas uh, from, from New York City uh, in 2001, um, over 18 years ago. And uh, one of the frustrating, because it's, it's, there's always a lot of New Yorkers, but um, there, there weren't a lot of us as many 18 years ago. Uh, the city was a lot different. Um, one of the difficulties when you move down here, honestly, is finding something to eat. I don't like to say it at weird times because for us, there's no weird time. Um, so whether it's late at night uh, or early in the morning, uh, four years after I came down here for the first time, I moved off uh, to a house off Anderson Street. Um, and at that point in time, it was just called North Charlotte. And a couple of years later, um, people started referring to it as NODA. Uh, I started working um, in, uh, in, in this, this weird job of, of being a stagehand. Uh, stagehand, uh, we, we're, we're the, 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 the guys and girls that wear black, uh, that show up to the, the arenas at six o'clock in the morning, uh, before a concert. We, we unload trucks and we, we, um, um, put the stage together, uh, so you can watch a show. Uh, the thing about doing that in a place like Charlotte um, is that it could be hard to find somewhere to eat. You know, um, when I moved uh, to, to, to where I moved to, uh, getting from Anderson Street uh, to the arena uh, was Time Warner Cable Arena at that point in time. Uh, you went through this down, I, I found this odd street. There was no real Google Maps or ways at that point in time. Um, and I went down this odd street and I would see this, this little building. And um, I avoided it for a while. Honestly, it was a, a bit of implicit bias. Um, it looked kind of dangerous to me. I didn't know what was going on. It wasn't always open. Um, um, but somebody on, on, you know, on a gig one day said, yeah, I should go and check it out. And it was Brooks Sandwich Shop. And uh, I got a burger there one day. And I saw that they, uh, that they open early and uh, they would, uh, they serve breakfast sandwiches. There's not a lot of places in Charlotte you could just get a bacon, egg, and cheese and a coffee in the morning. Um, so I started going in there. And uh, again, implicit bias. You know, this was this weird place uh, with a bunch of old, look to me, old country white folks that I had never seen before. And it was uncomfortable. It was grimy in there. And, um, but everybody always had a smile. And when it was, it was, it was, I just wanted to get my order in. I didn't really know how to order. They have a weird way of ordering. They write it on a bag and they just, everybody always seems to get exactly um, what they, um, what they, what they pay for and what they order. Um, and I started going in there more often and instead of just kind of getting looks, looks past me, you, you started making eye contact with the cooks, uh, uh, the ladies up at the register, you know, start getting a little uh, friendlier. Uh, they ask you if, you know, you're getting the regular thing. Um, and you, you really started to become a part of this community, not necessarily just in Noda, but in Brook Sandwich Shop. And um, they became my neighbors, right? Those, those, those guys uh, be, and, 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 and their family, they, be, they, they come to, to know you. And still, I was never, didn't really, outside of the, the quick ordering and eating it almost before you walk out that front door, even though it's so small, um, I remember uh, after I was elected the first time, or e even after uh, Charlotte Uprising, I would go in there and they would show me love. Like you didn't know how those things play out to people in the community. 
when I got elected, you know, uh, they were smiles. <laughs> um, you know, after we got uh, the housing trust fund passed for $50 million uh, in 2018, um, Scott reached out to me. And he was so excited. He was so excited. And I got, he reached out to me. He sent um, uh, uh, messages out through other folks, through Robert, <laughs> Robert Dawkins, that, the, the, the guys at Brooks, they love you, man. And they, 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 they you got to go over there because they, they want to they talk about something. And, and, and Scott said, you know, man, this is my city. You know, I just, I just, want, I love the way it's growing. And, uh, you know, I would joke with him, all right, how long is this place going to last? You know, when, when, you gonna, when they going to push you out? It's like, they're never going to do that. They're never going to do that. But I got this land over on the east side. And I, we want to, we want to make sure that affordable housing isn't, uh, is put up on there, is put up on there. And I didn't really know exactly how to do it. So I, I passed his, um, his, his, his contact information uh, uh, to Pam and um, I, I remember it was one of those things that I never really followed up on. We get so much stuff thrown at us all the time. And we pass along, hope something happens. And I you know, almost was afraid that uh, you know, I might have let them down. Mr. Winston, but this is an abuse. This is not personal privilege. You are abusing the courtesy of the rest of this chamber. This is not a mayor topic speech that you're making right now. If we all talked like this, we would be in here for over an hour. I would ask you to respect the rest of us and limit your remarks. Thank you. You can make that speech in a lot of places. I will make, you have this, cameras speech. Following I will make this speech right here, right now. Right here, right now. When's the last time you've had a friend murdered? When was the last time you've had a friend murdered? This is not the when time. When was the last time you had a friend murdered? This is not the time. Rude. Well, uh, that was cheers rude. to you. Yeah, that was rude. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Winston, if you would like to yeah. conclude. And, uh, and uh, you know, it w I was really happy to, to, to show up to that Foundation for the Carolinas and see those two fellas, you know, sitting in that seat. Um, you know, uh, I've had many of people in my life killed. You know, I, I know what this morning feels like. I know many of us on this dais have as well. And, and I woke up this morning, I saw that. And, I, and I, it's the same feeling, right? You hope it's, you know it's, it's, it's somebody you know, it's somebody you love, but you hope it's not. And I, I talked to somebody at CMPD and it, my, my, you know, my, my, you know, I don't know what party the, the, the Brooks family is. Um, I don't totally know their background. I, I don't know, totally know, you know, if we're friends. I do know that those are my people. And um, yes, there are 102 other homicides uh, that have happened here in, in this city so far. Um, this one hurts me more than others, of course, because of my personal relationship with Scott and his family. Um, in the end, I'm, I'm still where I've been at for a long time. You know, we do have to do something, but we have to do something as a community, just like there's a community in Brooks Sandwich Shop, which I hope I will be able to get another cheeseburger from real soon. We have to treat each other better. We have to treat each other better. There's no one policy or ordinance. Uh, there is no one PSA or, or commercial or study that is going to happen. This is going to come from when all of us, and all of us, figure out how to treat each one another better, especially when we are at our worst places in life. So thank you for the privilege in being able to speak um, and communicate. I, um, my, unfortunately, as a elected official, my thoughts and prayers are with the Brooks family, whether that be the blood kin um, or, or the folks that, that, that frequent that restaurant. And that is a mainstay of, of not only Noda, but Charlotte in a time where there are not many pieces of authentic Charlotte left. So I'm grateful uh, to be able to call Scott one of my people. 
uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm very sad that we have to be here uh, doing this today. Ms. Ashmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> I agree with my colleague here, Mr. Winston, that we need to treat each other better, and it starts with counsel. And I, Mr. Winston, I, I appreciate you sharing that story. Um, you know, some of us may not feel that way or have, might have experienced it, but it is our responsibility to listen. Um, so I appreciate that, you sharing that. <clears throat> I want to welcome uh, new council members, um, Ms. Johnson, Mr. Graham, and um, Ms. Watlington. Um, I'm looking forward to working with you all. Uh, similar to Mr. Winston, I, I want to share a story about a recent experience. I was at the Food Lion store close to my uh, close to my home, and I saw a kid in the neighborhood that I haven't seen. I saw a kid from our neighborhood that I have not seen in a while, and I asked him and said, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. You used to always be in the streets uh, playing uh, sports. And he said, I'm trying not to get shot. And so as I asked him more questions about uh, what was the fear that he had, and he said, you know, I had challenges with some of my friends, and I'm concerned about my safety. And what he said, uh, I've been thinking about it for a while. Uh, violence in our streets is a serious issue, and, and we, need, we have to start with investing in our youth, especially with conflict resolution, where disagreements can be resolved in a respectful manner. And I know that together we can do that with our colleagues in county commission, on school board, uh, with our judicial system. But I agree that we do need to do more than what we are doing right now, as Mayor Pro Temp had mentioned. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ejmira. Motion for adjournment. Second. second. <laughs> I guess I can second it. All in favor <laughs> of adjourning the meeting. This All right. Aye. Aye. Thank Great you. <sighs>